What's up, y'all? Visionary CJ here, back with another video. And today, my goal is to be transparent and tell a story. So I had lunch the other day with one of my white friends, one of my white brothers in Christ. And we were talking about the racial issues that were going on. Um, and he was just saying like, man, I wish I knew what it felt like to be black. Uh, Cause I don't really understand even though I want to. And I was just like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, I understand that you don't understand, right, and that you never will, um, but I guess my job is to just is explain my experiences, um, because that's all I do. I only talk from what I experience. So today, I want to talk about those experiences. In this video, I'm going to share four instances where I've been uh, a victim of racism or um, or an experience where I've been um, where I've been just oppressed as a black man. So this might be kind of tough for me to talk about just because it, like, it's hurtful. You know, if, you, if you've if ever been just discriminated against um, or just ostracized because of your skin color, like it's not a good feeling. Um, and thankfully, I, I think a lot of the, many of these times that I'm going to talk about today, I didn't really fully process it in the moment. But it's like now as I as I'm growing and evolving as a man, like I'm looking back at those moments and I can see how they've affected me and how they've helped me grow and just helped me um, learn more about what it means to be black in America. Because, yes, I am a black man. Right. Um, so let's talk about it. So my first one happened in college, my freshman year of college. Um, if you if you know my, my background, my story, you know, I grew up playing sports. Um, so I was not really out in the like, uh, I guess, party scene like as a high schooler and middle schooler, you know, if that even exists. <laughs> I, I was um, deeply, deeply into sports. And now that I'm talking about it and thinking about it, it's kind of cool, you know, looking back at that now. And I don't know if you noticed, but in sports, black men are put on a pedestal because they're usually more athletic, right? And I think I experienced that growing up. I didn't feel like I was less than because in the realm that I was playing in, you know, the game I was playing in, I wasn't less than. I was, you know, superior over those that didn't look like me. But once I left that world of uh, being an athlete playing sports, I dove into just regular social America, I guess. And so my freshman year, um, I got in a party scene and I was just falling under pressure to just the, the, the picture that society painted of me. You know, I was um, influenced by rap music. Like at the time, my favorite rapper was Young Dolph. And so I remember just riding through campus, blasting Young Dolph, uh, talking about, you know, 16 zips, 28 grams, all right, all of that. Um, and so that's kind of just the life that I fell into. Um, unconsciously, I think so just because my subconscious mind was just soaking up all that information about you know money, sex, drugs, and so that's eventually what I just gravitated to um, as a free black man, young black man. And so my freshman year, I decided to throw a party. My 19th birthday, what better way to celebrate than throwing a function, right? And so that's what I did. On campus, I decided to throw a party, and it didn't end so well, right? Like about an hour in uh, into the party, you know, I'm in there pouring up drinks, all this, being a good party host. Uh, and we get a knock on the door, a loud knock. Somebody opens the door and it's the police. Right, and they, the person that opened the door, they just froze. And they, I heard somebody say, oh, it's 12. And so I'm in the kitchen at the time and pouring up alcohol, like I said. And so once I heard that it was, you know, the police, I decided to take the alcohol and move it to the bathroom. All right, I guess that fight or flight, I tried to just be a superhero and um, take the alcohol to the bathroom because I knew that if it was out in the open, you know, everybody under 21, which we all, pretty much all were, um, would all be in trouble. And so I decided to take it to the, the bathroom to, I don't know what I was gonna do with it, hide it, I guess. But a uh, police officer saw me go into the bathroom. And so I go to the bathroom, close the door, and then maybe 30 seconds later, a police officer banged on the door, <clears throat> open up, open up. And so open, open the door, hands up, and the guy asked me, the police officer asked me, he said, hey, what'd you just flush? And I'm like, I didn't flush anything. And he's like, oh yeah, well, I'm gonna put you in handcuffs until I figure out what it is you flushed. 
And so, boom, right there, I'm placed in handcuffs um, just because of what the officer thought I did in that bathroom. And he walks me out to the living room. You know, I'm already in handcuffs. And I'm the first one in handcuffs the room, you know, a dorm room full of people. And it's just, like, scary. But I didn't, I'm not processing it. I'm just, you know, living right in the moment. And so about another minute comes by, come, goes past, and he comes out the bathroom, and he's like, are you 21? And I say, no, I'm not. And he says, well, you're going to jail for illegal possession of alcohol, right? Because I put the alcohol under the cabinet, and I guess he saw it, and boom. And so there I am, tells me I'm going to jail. You know, it didn't even breathalyze me. It didn't even ask if I've been drinking. You know, he just puts me in handcuffs and say I'm, says I'm going to jail. And so, man, this last, so I'm there in the dorm room in handcuffs for about two hours because they're just checking out everything, you know, telling people to leave, getting people's information, all that. And so when I'm finally able to leave, um, I go into the police car and there's an older black cop that, a lady cop that was driving me to the uh, police station. And I'm sitting there, one of my homies was with me as well, who I got arrested. And she was just like, hey, son, I'm sorry you have to go through this. Um, you just happen to be the wrong color on the wrong night. And so here I am, you know, freshly 19 years old, and she tells me this, and I'm not able to process it. I'm just kind of scared because I don't know what's about to happen when I get to this jail. Um, but I end up going to jail, spending the night there, and it just wasn't a good feeling. Like, I knew that that's not where I belonged. It just wasn't a good environment, you know, and I just saw... Um, saw that the the jail system you know that was just my first entry there and and looking back at it I found out that the officer had said that he breathalyzed me and I failed and that's why he arrested me but you know that didn't happen or whatever so I get out and I'm like okay I gotta change my mindset I gotta make something shake because I didn't like that feeling um and so fast forward my sophomore year of college um Sophomore year of college, I, I, well, I was still still throwing parties, right? I didn't really learn my lesson. <laughs> so the, I think the day after, the morning after a party, I had a young lady in the bed with me, and it's like 9 a.m., and I hear a bang on the door. She tells me to, to wake up because I don't know who it may be. And so I run to the, I don't run, but I walk to the door, check through the people, and it looks like the SWAT team, right? And I'm just like, uh... Okay, and so I go back in my room and I try to hide anything that could get me in trouble. And while I'm doing that, an officer busts into my into my room, guns already in the air, pointed at me and just tells me to freeze. And I didn't do anything wrong. I'm just there, like what is going on? And he asks me if I know why they're there. After he gets my information and stuff, he asks me if I know why why they're there, and I'm like, no. And he says, well, your roommate is wanted for rape. I'm just like, what? How did I not know this? Um, but to me, what really is just traumatic is just the fact that they busted in my room with their guns already in the air, like pointed at me. And especially like, you know, looking forward to now and just knowing what happened to Breonna Taylor and how they fired through her crib, you know, killed her in her own house. Like that could have easily been me at, what, 20 years old. Because um, they didn't even know who I was, right? They didn't really tell me what was happening until after they got my information and called into the whoever they call and make sure that I was clear. But it's just like that, that was traumatic for me as a black man. And I didn't really like it at all. And it's crazy how just one, you know, one situation could have went differently. Like my life could have been taken that day for no reason. And so I fast forward again, and um, maybe my after those two instances with the police, my freshman and sophomore year, I decided to take a break from school. You know, I took a year off from school. Um, I got into entrepreneurship. I got into personal development. I started reading. Um, I moved to Atlanta. I got to see with my own eyes, you know, successful black people because I didn't really grow up seeing uh, successful entrepreneurs. I didn't even know what entrepreneurship was until college. So I just immersed myself into personal development, you know, during that year off. And it just propelled me to a whole nother level. Um, and I also was able to get on with Delta. I worked for them for like a month or two. Um, but I was able to just get um, flight benefits from doing that. And so I was able to travel and see the world, you know, 
such an amazing thing. And again, I experience racism and it's different when it's in America versus overseas. And in some ways it's better, some ways it's not, but I experience two things, uh, two run-ins with racism. And the first one was, um, I went to China with a friend and I would never ever go back there. <laughs> Disclaimer, because it seems like I would, it seems like every, you know, every Chinese person there was just either frightened or just shocked to see me. And the frightened one, the frightened emotion was really the one that <clears throat> was traumatic for me. I remember just trying to get taxis and people just, you know, not letting me in. Even though I had money, I was there for a reason. They just weren't rocking with me. But <clears throat> one night, me and my friend are going, you know, looking for a club, looking for something to do, right? Just me and him, different country. Um, so we're looking for something to do. And we found a club. It looks lit. It's a lot of lights, a lot of noise. And so we try to go go in there. And the guy is just like, oh, he's just shaking his head. No, like, no, no. And then we're like, what's going on? And me, it's like I, <laughs> I could feel the weird energy, like just the, the kind of person I am. I'm energetically sensitive, so when I feel weird energy, I just back away. And so I felt that energy, and he was talking to my friend, and the security bouncer ended up saying, like, we don't allow black people in the club. I'm just like, wow, right? Like, I've never heard anyone just blatantly say something like that. And it made me think, like, dang, are we in the 50s, or is this, you know? the 21st century but he says it straight up and I'm just like wow and my friend like he <laughs> he's not as calm as me so he started snapping you know we ended up just walking away because there's no telling what could have happened but that just made me feel like so low of a person somebody just telling me you can't I don't even know you but because you look the way you do like you're probably gonna do something bad so you can't come in this club like that's terrible and uh, my last experience was with Delta again And I, uh, during this time, like, I'm able to travel, like I said, right? And so I went to Paris, uh, like, three times. <clears throat> but one time I took my dad, and we were able to get first class. And by this time, like, I know, you know, some, some of the um, flight attendants that worked at Paris Flight. And so me and my dad in first class, and it's a black lady flight attendant who I was cool with. And she comes, and she's like, hey, I'm going to tell you something. You know, my coworkers asked if you were a rapper. I was like, what? <laughs> My rapper? And it didn't, again, it didn't process during that time, but just looking back on it, it's like, dang, why Why do people, white people, um, associate just high status with entertainment, rapping, hooping, you know, any type of thing like that? And it just like, you know, exposes the fact that we black people are looked at as less than unless they have some type of um, competitive advantage, whether it be entertainment, really just entertainment. Um, but it felt good to be like, nah, I'm not a rapper, you know, I'm just a regular guy. But still, it's just like that assumption, that stereotype, it didn't feel good at all, looking back on it. And so for me, it's just, uh, all of these, these four experiences were hurtful. And there's so many more that I could say but I just wanted to talk about those four and say that uh, it's not okay to judge someone based on their skin color. And I encourage people, black and white and whatever race you are, to just have conversations and ask, you know, black people, especially since we're living in this time, ask them about some, some moments where they've experienced racism and just hear their stories so you can try to understand and try to feel the energy, feel the pain that they've experienced because it's not a fun thing, it's not right, and it has to change. So let me know what you think about this. Subscribe uh, to the YouTube where I just try to you know, bring transparency through storytelling and try to share my heart and hopefully help somebody out. So do that for me. Visionary CJ out, peace.